Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here is how I added modding to my Kitchen Chaos game. Now this video is a showcase slash tutorial on how I added this and how you can add complex mods to your game. In a previous video I already covered how to get started with Unity's user generated content tool, and in there I mentioned how user generated content can really be anything, it's really just bytes. It's up to you as the developer to decide what content you want to allow as mods. Every game is unique, so I can't really make a step-by-step -step tutorial that covers how to add modding to every single different game type. Every game implementation is going to be different. So I don't want you to look at this video as a step-by-step -step tutorial, but rather just learn the core concepts behind how to add modding to any game. Which, in reality, modding is actually pretty simple. Your players will have the final build of your game, then you probably have some special modding folder, and your players will add some files to that folder inside your game files. Then your game needs to dynamically load those files that the player added in some way, depending on their type. After you load them, then you give the player some UI to create whatever mods you want to enable with your game using the player's assets. Then you create some sort of file that contains those rules or whatever data the player selected, and then optionally take that file and upload it to something like Steam Workshop or Unity's user-generated content tool. So in general terms, those are the steps for how to implement modding in any game. By the way, in the future I will be following this tutorial myself when I add modding to my Steam game Dinky Gardens, which has just come out. In fact, let me actually take this time to ask you what types of mods would you like to see in that game? I'm obviously thinking of letting the player mod new resource types and crafting recipes, perhaps even some new machines with some custom level logic, and maybe even some completely new game modes and scenarios, kind of like Factorio does it. So I have plenty of ideas myself, but do let me know your ideas for mods. So as a demo, here I have my game Kitchen Chaos. This game was fully built from scratch in my free complete course, and then I also expanded it into multiplayer in the second course. Now this game is all about controlling a character and cooking some food. Some customer requests come in and the player needs to prepare the food and cook it in various ways to match the final recipe. So basically the game is all about recipes and objects. Here is the recipe SO scriptable object, which was made from scratch in the complete course. As you can see, it really just has a list of kitchen object SO. And then the kitchen object SO, this is the type for every individual kitchen object type, so every ingredient, all of that is made up of this, and in turn this one contains a prefab, so a transform for the prefab that is instantiated, this is what contains the 3D mesh, then it has a simple sprite icon, and finally a string for the object name. So as a developer I decide that this is what I want to make moddable, I want players to be able to create new kitchen objects. So here in my demo I've got a bunch of completely new kitchen objects that I created as simple mods. For example this one over here, this one is a battery. It doesn't really make sense in the context of this game, but it's a great example of how after you build the tools then your players can mod anything they want, it doesn't have to match the actual game itself. So I've got a container counter which has my moddable item and I can interact with it and pick it up just like I can pick up any of the built-in items. Here you can see how this is a working kitchen object, and importantly the mod includes the battery over here the 3D mesh, it includes the texture, it includes a 2D icon, and the name itself. All of that data, all of that was added by a player, so none of this was included in the original game build. Then I also created a recipe with that custom kitchen object. So for example, one of the customers is requesting a recipe with a battery, so I just pick up a plate, I put the battery on the plate, and yep, there it is. Again, a completely custom object, and I can deliver it, and yep, success, everything worked perfectly. So here we can see a custom mod, so a player created an object, and all of it is working on top of the game that I built, following all the rules. Then here is the super basic in-game UI for how to actually create a mod. I basically just created a special folder and I called it mods input. Now in the original build of the game, this folder would have been completely empty. And then I, as a player, I created all of these assets and I dumped them inside this folder. You can see over here I've got some mesh files, some obj, I've got some icons, some pngs, and some textures, so some jpegs. Then in Unity, this simply y simply cycles through all of the files in that folder. It identifies which files are meshes, which files are textures, and which ones are icons. So in here I can just select whatever I want, like for example select the battery, I can select the texture for the battery mesh, I can select the battery icon and give the object a name, then I can create a mod. And now there's a second folder, this one called Mods Complete. And on this one, yep, here it is, the battery that I just created. Then back in the main game window, and yep, there it is, the mod was correctly loaded, and here is my custom battery, my custom mod. Okay, so that's the concept. Now let's see how I implemented all of this. But again, keep in mind, every single game is different, so pay attention to the concepts that I'm doing and not exactly the specifics. So like I said, the first step for adding modding to your games is being able to load some assets dynamically. In order to support custom objects, I need to be able to load a 3D mesh, then I also need to be able to to load a texture for that mesh, also need a sprite for the icon, and then just a basic string for the name. 
Out of all of those, the trickiest one to load is just the dynamic loading the 3D mesh. That one was actually surprisingly difficult. Normally I use .fbx files for my meshes. It's really the most widely used format. If you've bought any assets from the store, chances are they are in .fbx. However, it turns out that fbx files are actually really complex and loading them at runtime is really difficult. Now, there are some paid tools on the store that apparently can do that, so that's still an option. But for modding, I also don't specifically need the mesh to be in .fbx. It can be in other formats, for example, .obj, which is apparently quite a bit simpler. And while Unity doesn't have a built-in method for unloading them, there is a simple free asset on the store that does exactly that. So I originally started with this battery mesh. I grabbed this one from the Polygon military pack. In order to convert this .fbx onto a .obj, it's actually quite simple. You can just drag the mesh onto a scene. Then you can open this mesh with ProBuilder. So just go into Tools, ProBuilder, and open the ProBuilder window. Then you can ProBuilderize this mesh. And then here you can click on Export. Click on the plus icon. And up here you can select all the various types that you can export into. So exporting into OBJ, exactly what I want. So just export this and yep, you convert a .fbx into a .obj. So with that, yep, here I have the .obj file. Then here is the code for using that asset, which takes a path for the obj file and then simply loads it as a game object. Then that game object simply has a regular mesh filter component. And from that, I can easily grab the mesh data. So that handles that I'm loading a mesh. By the way, for getting that path, you really just need to cycle through a directory. Here is the code that I have on that UI window that is doing just that. So I've got a path for the mod inputs folder. For that one, I'm just using application.datapath. This contains the path to the game data folder. So just that, and then I put it on a subfolder mods input. So just creating a directory info from that one, and then just calling get files and get files just of this extension. So in this case, I'm only looking for .obj. That returns a file info array. And then inside this file info, you've got two things. You've got the name, which is just the name of the file. And then you've got the full name, which contains the full path to that object. The full path is what you use over here on the obj loader. Okay, so like I said, that handles dynamic loading the mesh. Then for dynamically loading a texture, that one is actually super easy. Unity already has a built-in method for doing just that. Here is some simple code. So basically just get the path to the actual texture. Then just use file.readAllBytes in order to read all the bytes of that file and load it onto a byte array. Then with that, you can create a brand new texture 2D, make it a completely empty texture, and then just call texture2d.loadImage and pass in the byte array. And yep, that will load this texture and load it onto this texture 2D image. Then you can use this texture in the material that we can apply to the previous mesh. Okay, so the next data that we need is a sprite. This one is also super easy. Once again, we just get the path and we read the bytes from that path. Then we load an image onto a texture 2D, so exactly the same as previously. Then we just use sprite.create in order to basically convert this icon texture into an actual icon sprite. And finally, the string for the object name. This one doesn't really require anything special, so I just used a regular text mesh pro input field component and just grabbed the text. So with all of that, we can easily grab all of the data that we need. We can dynamically load all of it based on whatever the player drops in that mod's input folder. And then I opted to put all that data, all the mod data in a single mod file. Now you don't have to do this. This step is optional. If you want, you can keep the mesh and the textures and whatever objects you have. You can keep all of them as separate files. But to make things easier, I just merge them all into a single file. Now I'm going to show the code, but if you want to learn about this process of saving multiple pieces of data in a single file, if you want to see that in more detail, I cover that in the save file screenshot video. So here I have my save mod function. As you can see, it takes various paths as parameters. So a path to the mesh object, a path to the texture, the icon, and a string for the object name. Here it has all the paths, and then the code is just what we saw. For saving, we really just want to read those objects, just load them, and then grab all the bytes that we're going to use in the final save data. So here I'm using the obj loader, so I'm using that asset in order to load the mesh obj onto a game object. Then I grab the mesh from that game object, and then I simply made a mesh data struct. Here it is, it's just a super basic structure, just holds the vertices, UVs, and triangles. This is really all the data that makes up a mesh. So here we grab the unload mesh, and we store all of the vertices, triangles, and UVs. Then with this mesh data, over here I opted to save this data as JSON. Now this is obviously not the best in terms of space compression, but for this simple demo it works great. So I just convert all that data into a JSON string, and then I take that JSON string and convert it into an array of bytes. Then I just save those bytes in my save file and add extra data to my header. Again, I covered basic save and loading with JSON in another video, and I also covered how to make a complex save file with extra data in the save file screenshot video. What I'm doing here is literally the exact same thing that I'm doing there. So this just saves all of the mesh data. Then for the texture, we really just read the bytes over here. We don't even want to load a texture. Same thing for the icon and for the name byte array. So we really just convert a string into some bytes. Then here we are constructing the file 
file header with all of the data and finally completing all of the bytes for the final file. Like I said, this is optional. You can have your mods made up of multiple files or you can put them all into a single file like I did here and then simply file that write all bytes, write all these bytes onto a single file. And also like I mentioned the Unity's user generated content tutorial. On that video, I mentioned how that tool works simply with some bytes. And yep, over here, as you can see, we do have a list of bytes. Now in the demo, all I'm doing is just saving these locally but you could definitely take these bytes and instead of saving to a local file, you could upload it to Unity's UGC or perhaps something like Steam Workshop. Again, remember how mod data is really just bytes. It's up to you as a developer to decide what those bytes will represent. Then for loading, here is my loading function. It's really just doing the exact same thing, but reverse logic. So it starts out with a byte array, which I load with file.load on bytes. And then I made it have some output parameters for the things that this is going to output. So it grabs a complete byte list, then grabs the correct bytes based on the offsets. First, it grabs the header. It parses that JSON back into an actual object. With the header loaded, I then know the file data and all of the sizes for all of the various data types. So over here, I'm grabbing the icon byte list. And then like we saw, once I have a byte list, or a byte array. With that, I can easily load that icon bytes into an actual icon sprite. For the object name, that is really just converting bytes back into a string. For the texture, once again, we just go into texture 2D and call load image to convert bytes into a texture. And finally, for the mesh data, like I said, I opted to store this as a simple JSON file. So I just grab that JSON data and construct the brand new mesh using the vertices, triangles, and UVs. And yep, with all that, this load function, this one loads all the objects on a given byte array. It loads all of that and outputs all the save data that was saved in the mod file. Then with that data, here is a simple function for creating a kitchen object as so. Well. Over here, I've got all of the parameters that I need in order to turn that data into a kitchen object as so. Here, it just duplicates a default material and then sets the base map texture. Then instantiates a debug prefab. It gives it a name. It goes into the mesh filter and assigns the mesh that we just loaded. It goes into the mesh render and assigns the material. Then uses scriptable object, create instance of type kitchen object as so in order to create a brand new scriptable object. And just fills in the data for that scriptable object. So the object name, the prefab and the sprite and then goes into the prefab and tells it, okay, now you belong to this kitchen object or so. So finally, with all of this, we end up with a mod kitchen object or so. For unloading all the mods, like we saw, I'm here going through the entire mods complete folder, cycling through all the mods in that folder, then I'm going to load all of those, create a kitchen object or so for all of those. And then just for testing here, I've got some nice code. I just manually placed some container counters and set them to this kitchen object. I made sure to add this brand new kitchen object so to the kitchen object so valid list on the plate, otherwise I couldn't add it to a plate. And again, just for testing, I created a brand new recipe so that takes just get this kitchen object to make it all work. And that's really it. Since the rest of the game was written to work with kitchen object SOs, regardless of where they came from, everything else already works perfectly. So here is the demo again, and I've got my three counters with my three moddable objects. I can go up here, and yep, there you go, I'm picking up a crystal that I added as a moddable object. I can pick up a pig and a battery. So all of these, all of these objects, these were all added afterwards. So none of these files, none of these meshes and textures, none of this was included in the original game build. And then I've got the testing recipes that I created. So for example, someone wants a crystal, so I can pick up a plate, add the crystal to the plate, and it and yep, success, it works. All right, awesome. Now, once again, like I said, it's up to you as the developer to decide what you want to enable as modding for your games. In this case, all I did was just enable just brand new kitchen objects. But of course, you can follow the exact same logic to expand upon it and allow modding for multiple different things. For example, you could expand upon this and mod the actual recipes instead of just making testing recipes. You could make the entire level moddable so that players could create their own levels. You can enable players to create brand new counter types. You can enable players to edit all the rules. So for example, the level timer, how many recipes are spawned and so on. Again, it's up to you as a developer to figure out what you want to enable as modding. All right, so to recap, to add modding to your game, every game will be unique, so these are the general steps you need to follow. Your players will have the final build of your game. Then you probably have some special modding folder where your players can add some files. Then your game needs to dynamically load those files in some way, depending on their type. After you load them, then you need to give the players some UI to create whatever mods you want to enable for your game. Then you can create some file that contains those rules or whatever that the player select for the mod. And then optionally, you can take that file and upload it to something like Steam Workshop or Unity's user-generated content tool. So in general terms, those are the steps for how to implement modding to any game. Now, if you want to learn how this game was built from scratch, check out my two free complete courses. First on making the game in single player and then multiplayer. And also for uploading your mods, check out Unity's user-generated content tool. Then check out my new game and let me know what type of mod support you'd like me to add in a future update. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.